Um, welcome to Tuffy's Infection Prevention 101 module. Uh, my name is Dee Jung, and I am the project coordinator for Tuffy's Small Rural Healthcare Assistance Unit. Thank you so much for being here, and we appreciate everybody's time. So before we begin the lecture, we would like to briefly introduce what and who Tuffy is and discuss the journey. Uh, the Texas Epidemic Public Health Institute, or Tuffy for short, is headquartered here at UT Health Houston's School of Public Health. It is funded by the governor's office and a state organization that works to keep Texans safe and the Texas economy strong by preparing Texas for the next infectious disease outbreak. This is a brief timeline of Tuffy since its inception in 2020 in response to the COVID-19 pandemic. As you can see, Tuffy is striving to and continues to work on developing key programs, producing educational summits based on public health preparedness, certification programs, and currently expanding those programs, training and more while growing partnerships and offering resources across Texas. So Tuffy is located within UT Health School of Public Health, which is the fourth largest school of public health in the nation. We have campuses all over Texas and have integrated this program within multiple disciplines within our academic system. Under Tuffy, we have three different operational cores. The first one being the training and resources, the second one, the readiness, and the third, the communications. Um, the Small Rural Healthcare Assistance Program is under the Readiness Corps, and the overarching goals of our program are to, one, provide small rural hospitals with infection prevention education and readiness, and two, provide rural communities highly impacted by the pandemic with local resources they can use in order to prevent and mitigate disease, oh, sorry, and to avoid overwhelming small rural hospital capacities. Before we begin, um, I would like to introduce our speaker for today. Kayla Rush received her bachelor's in biological science from South Dakota State University in 2012, her master's in public health with a concentration in environmental and occupational health from here at UT Health at School of Public Health in 2018. And after graduation, she entered the infection prevention and control field in healthcare settings. And during the COVID-19 pandemic, she has had opportunities to work in Texas, New York, and California assisting and implementing programs in different healthcare facilities. She returned to UT Health in the fall of 2021 to pursue her PhD in epidemiology, focusing on infection prevention and control. So without further ado, Kayla. Thank you, Dee, for the introductions. Just a reminder, we are recording today's session and we ask that all questions are kept until the end and we'll open up the floor for Q&A. So our, the first module that we are discussing today gives a brief overview of infection prevention. Today's learning objectives are to understand and implement effective hand hygiene cultures in a facility, to understand and implement the correct use of personal protective equipment or PPE, to understand the chain of transmission and learn how to prevent and disrupt it, to identify infectious diseases that are required to be reported to our public health officials, and to understand and implement effective infection prevention control practices. The first component that we are going to discuss today is hand hygiene. Clean hands are the single most important factor in preventing the spread of pathogens and antibiotic resistance in healthcare settings. Hand hygiene reduces the incidence of healthcare associated infections and healthcare related exposures. The CDC estimates that nearly 2 million patients in the United States get infections in hospitals, and about 90,000 of these patients will die as a result from their infection. More widespread use of hand hygiene products will improve the adherence of hand hygiene practices throughout the facility to promote a culture of patient and staff safety. Next, we're going to discuss how to perform hand hygiene using the CDC's recommendations of using hand hygiene with soap and water. When cleaning your hands with soap and water, you first want to wet your hands with water, apply a small amount of soap, and rub your hands vigorously together for at least 20 seconds. A longer time is permitted, but 20 seconds are the minimum. You wanna make sure all surfaces of your hands are covered thoroughly. After 20 seconds, you would like to rinse your water, or rinse your hands with soap and water and use a disposable paper towel to dry them. Then you will take a clean paper towel to turn off the faucet and discard it into the, in the trash. You would like to avoid using hot water due to this preventing the drying and cracking of skin. 
There are specific times when hand hygiene needs to be conducted with soap and water in healthcare settings versus using an alcohol-based hand sanitizer product. These specific events are when hands are visibly soiled after caring for a person with known or suspected infectious diseases and using um, hand hygiene with soap and water if the agent is producing spores, such as in C. diff or anthrax. These methods cannot be substituted with using alcohol-based sanitizer and must be used with soap and water. The CDC has the following procedures when performing hand hygiene with alcohol-based hand sanitizer in healthcare settings. You want to put a small amount of the product onto your hands and rub together. You would want to cover all surfaces of your hands until they feel dry, and this should take about 20 seconds. You need to let hands dry completely when using alcohol-based hand sanitizer. Do not blow or wipe your hands with the product until the, it is completely dry. Just as we mentioned before, there are specific times when you can use an alcohol-based product compared to using soap and water. These situations are the following. Immediately before touching a patient, before performing an aseptic technique or handing invasive medical devices, before moving from working on a soiled part of a body to a clean site on the same patient, after touching a patient or the patient's immediate environment, and after getting in contact with blood, body fluids, or contaminated surfaces, and immediately after removing gloves. Soap and water can be substituted for these methods. Many healthcare accreditation organizations such as CMS, Joint Commissions, and others observe facility hand, hide, hand hygiene culture, culture when visiting, uh, when conducting site visits, and they report hand hygiene compliance. Since 2000s, Leapfrog Hospital Group has been grading healthcare facilities based on patient safety, quality, and transparency. These are publicly available metrics that anyone can view. One of the critical components of patient safety were the the organization ties hand hygiene into this metric. The group provides an overall grade to F rating on the facility based on many metrics. To help ensure good hand hygiene compliance in facilities, it is recommended to have a hand hygiene monitoring program. This involves looking at engineering controls, such as physical placement of sinks and hand hygiene dispensers throughout the facility and the overall hand hygiene culture within. Specific organizations such as CMS, Joint Commission and LeapFrog requires a specific number of compliant hand hygiene observations per month, depending on the number of beds, facility type, and service line in the facility. This program can look very different at each facility, such as having electronic monitoring systems or using pen and paper to track observations using blind observers. Here's an example of a CDC hand auditing tool that is readily available on the CDC website, and the link is in the slide deck. Here's the second page. It shows just different observation categories with specific examples to help you understand how to track and trend this. The next component that we are going to discuss is the importance, the importance of using and understanding personal protective equipment, or PPE. Personal protective equipment, or PPE, is defined by OSHA as specialized clothing or equipment worn by an employee for protection against infectious material. This is usually gloves, gowns, masks, respiratory uh, protection, goggles, and face shields. Personal protective equipment aims to, to provide personnel with safe measures in healthcare environment. OSHA and CD have specific protocols on putting on PPE, which is referred to donning PPE and removing or doffing PPE. The next slide, we will walk through the CDC recommendations of donning and doffing PPE. The first example we will talk through is donning or putting on PPE. The first step is always conducting appropriate and effective hand hygiene with either soap and water or an alcohol-based product. After you perform hand hygiene, the next step will be to place on your gown. Gowns can come in many different styles in your facility, so become familiar what type of style of gown that you have. If your gown has ties, remember that you must tie the gown in the back so the dangling straps don't accidentally cross-contaminate your field that you're working in. Pull the gown completely on and fasten and tie in the back. Next, you will place a mask or respiratory 
uh, respirator over your face. Masks can come in many different forms, just like gowns, so we become familiar with what types of masks your facility has to offer. You wanna make sure the mask is secure by fitting the flexible band on the node bridge and making sure that the mask fits nice and snug on your face and is pulled below your chin. If you're wearing a respirator, make sure that you wear the appropriate size when you're conducting your fit check, usually performed by occupational health. The next step is to place goggles or a face shield over your mask. You wanna pull this over your face and adjust it to fit and make sure that your vision is not impaired with the fit. Lastly, you wanna put on gloves. In some specific circumstances, you will be wearing two types of gloves with working with specific pathogens. If, you're, if your PPE requires two layers of glove, the first layer of gloves will be put on after you conduct hand hygiene and the last layer will be your last step as mentioned. Next, we're gonna go over one of two examples of doffing or removing PPE. The first step is to remove your gloves. Be aware that these are contaminated. Your hands may get contaminated with your glove removal, and if that happens, you wanna make sure that you use an alcohol-based hand sanitizer that is readily available. After you're using hand sanitizer, when you remove all the all of your PPE at the end of the step, you will want to wash your hands again with soap and water to ensure that no cross-contamination cross has occurred. The next step will be removing the goggles or the face shield. Be aware that the outside of the goggles, just like the gloves, are contaminated and should be avoid touching. If you accidentally contaminate your hands, immediately wash them with alcohol sanitizer and then wash them at the end of removing all PPE. If the goggles or face shield is a reusable item, you wanna place it in the designated receptacle for reprocessing or follow the manual for instructive use or IF use for reprocessing. If this is a single use item, you wanna discard it in the waste container. Next, you'll remove the gown. Be aware that the sleeves in the front of the gown are contaminated. You wanna ensure that you're not cross-contaminating yourself, and if you do, use hand sanitizer if you come into a contaminated surface. Pull the gown away from the neck and shoulders, touching the inside of the gown only, and fold and roll it down into a bundle and discard it in the waste container. The next step is to remove your respirator or face mask. Just like before, the outside is contaminated and wanna be avoid touching with your hands. Grasp the bottom ties or elastic straps of the mask and respirator and remove it from the top to the bottom without touching the front. You want to discard it in a waste container. And the last step is to perform hand hygiene. If you think your hands have come into contact with any soiled piece of PPE during this time, make sure you want to use soap and water for a minimum of 20 seconds. Next, the second example of doffing or removing PPE is followed. The first step is to remove the gown and gloves just like we did in step one. Be aware the outside has been contaminated and you should avoid touching. If your hands do become contaminated, make sure you use hand sanitizer. You wanna grasp the gown in front and pull it away from the body so the ties break, touching the outside of the, go the gown only with the gloved hands. When removing the gown, fold and roll the gown inside into a bundle. As you are removing the gown, peel off your gloves at the same time, only touching the inside of the gloves and the gown with your bare hand. Place the gown and the gloves in a waste container. The next step is removing the goggles or face shield. Be aware that the outside of the goggles is contaminated and should be avoid touching. If your hands do come into contact with it, perform hand hygiene. Remove goggles or face shield from the back by lifting the headband without touching the front of the goggles or face shield. If the item is reusable, place it in the designated receptacle bin for reprocessing and follow the instructions for use or IFUs for reprocessing. If this is a single use item, dispose of it in a waste container. Next, we'll remove the mask or respirator. Just like before, the outside is contaminated and should be avoided being touched. Grasp the bottom ties or the elastic bands of the mask and respirator from the top and remove it without touching the front. Discard in the waste container. And just like we've mentioned before, the last step is to perform hand hygiene. 
If you think your hands have come into contact with any soil piece of PPE during this process, make sure you use soap and water for a minimum 20 seconds. The next section we are gonna discuss is understanding the chain of transmission and how to disrupt it. To implement good infection prevention practices, an individual, an individual must understand the epidemiology triad of infectious disease. This epidemiological triangle disease model comprises of the host, the antigen, and the environment. The host is defined as a human or an other animal. The host can be affected by personal characteristics such as, as genetic factors or group or population demographics. The environment consists of all external factors associated to the host. This includes the biological, physical, and psychological environments of the host. And lastly, the, the agent may be bacteria, viruses, funguses, protozoan, helminths, or a prion. The agent can also be affected by a causal and risk factors among the environmental exposures. This dynamic interaction model changes with time and is in a state of equilibrium. Sometimes when there's a shift to this model, it can change and increase and decrease the disease frequency that you see in the population. Another important model to understand is the chain of infection. Understanding the components of the chain of infection and their relationship to each other is critical in determining the risk of infection and needed interventions to disrupt the process to prevent and mitigate transmission. This allows staff to identify and protect vulnerable patients and to take precautions to protect themselves. Each chain in sequential order must be presented for an, presented for an infection to incur and to create the infectious disease process. The links of an infectious agent are, the links are infectious agent, reservoir, portal of exit, mode of transition, portal of entry, and acceptable host. We'll discuss these each in length. In the chain of transmission, we will start with the infectious agent. The infectious agent is affected by multiple factors such as virulence, infectivity, pathogenicity, duration of exposure, size of inoculum, and population immunity. Virulence refers to the degree of which an organism can cause disease. It is important to understand that virulence of an agent, affect, the effectiveness of an agent to transmit to a new host, the ability to attach to the structure will it infect and the mechanism of proliferation. Infectivity is the ability of an infectious agent, bacteria, virus, fungus, or protozoan to pass from a sick individual to a healthy individual and cause disease. The infectivity of a patient is different from the transmissibility, which is described only by the ability to pass from one host to another and is not related to the ability to cause disease. Pathogenicity is the ability of the agent to cause disease. Duration of exposure, will highly impact the likelihood of disease developing. However, it also is dependent on the number of organisms needed to cause disease or what is known as the dose. Lastly, this can, affect, can be affected by the immunity of the population or also known as the herd immunity. Next, we will discuss what a re reservoir is. All organs have, organisms have a place where they can exist and reproduce and facilitate their transmission. Some examples of reservoirs are humans, animals, insects, food, and environment. Next, in the chain of transmission, an infectious agent needs a way to exit from its reservoir. The infectious agent can leave the host or the reservoir via the respiratory tract, the GI tract, contaminated skin, or weather via wind, rain, or an innate object that has been contaminated with an infectious agent. This is sometimes seen in natural disasters, such as hurricanes, flood events, or earthquakes. An infectious agent may be transmitted directly from its natural reservoir to a susceptible host. There are different types of classifications of modes of transmission, such as contact, droplet, airborne, bloodborne, vehicle, or vector. A vehicle is an inanimate object that can transmit an infectious agent to a susceptible host. Examples of vehicles can be medical devices, clothing, fur, metals, or plastic utensils. A bite from an infected arthropod species, such as the mosquito, ticks, sandflies, and others, can transmit things via a vector. 
In healthcare settings, individuals must be put on a level of precaution depending on the mode of transmission. Each level requires different level of PPE to be used and engineering controls such as negative, positive, or neutral airflow. CDC has a complete list of infectious agents and what level of precautions are required. We'll discuss this in detail. Indirect transmission, an infectious agent is transferred from a reservoir to a susceptible host by direct contact or spread, a droplet spread. Direct contact occurs through skin-to-skin -skin contact, kissing, or sexual intercourse. Some common example of agents that are contracted through direct contact transmission in healthcare settings are diarrheal illnesses, norovices, candida, C. Diff difficile, ESBL, lice, MDRO, MRSA, scabies, and others, to name a few. For individuals with agents that are spread by contact transmission, individuals need to be placed on contact precautions. The following is the CDC's recommendation of how to do this. The patient should be placed in a private single room. If a private room is unavailable, you need to create a zone of a minimum six feet between patients. A contact caution per side should be posted outside the patient's room and contact precautions should be communicated to all staff in, that are involved in patient care. A note in an order set with contact precautions should be initiated and placed in the patient's chart. All personnel, staff, and visitors entering the patient's room or environment should don on gloves and gowns. Individuals should wash their hands before and after exiting the room if patients have a C. difficile infection, individuals must use soap and water to wash their hands for a minimum of 20 seconds. When individuals leave the room, they need to doff their PPE, as previously talked about, and perform hand hygiene. You'll use standard precautions when handling soiled linens. And then also, depending on what type of agent this patient has, it might be required to report to your local health or state department of health. Next, we will talk about droplet spread. Droplet spread re re refers to the spray of, very of relatively large short rain aerosol procedures by sneezing, coughing, or even talking. Droplet spread is classified as direct transmission via direct spray over a few feet before the droplets fall to the ground. Some common examples of droplet spread in healthcare can be group A streptococcus infection, bacterial meningitis, mumps, and others. The following is the CDC's recommendation of how to implement droplet precautions. You need to place the patient in a single private room just as before. Droplet precautions should be posted outside the patient's room and communicated to all individuals involved in patient care. You should also place a note in an order set with droplet precautions in the patient's chart. All personnel, staff, and visitors entering the patient's room need to wear a mask and perform hand hygiene before, and before entering the room and leaving the room. The patient should also be asked to wear a mask when other individuals in, are in the room if they can tolerate it. If a patient is undergoing an aerosolizing procedure, then the healthcare provider should wear a higher level of respiratory protection, such as an N95 or powered air purified respirator, or known as PAPR. Some examples of aerosolizing procedures are sputum induction, intubation, exubation, and a bronchoscopy. Droplet precautions can be used along with contact precaution in some situations due to the side of the number of droplets the patient is producing. And you'll use standard precautions when handling the patient's soiled linen. Next, we're going to talk about airborne transmission. Airborne transmission occurs when infectious agents are carried by dust or droplet nuclei suspended in the air. Airborne dust includes materials that are settled on surfaces and become resuspended in the air current. Droplet nuclei are dried residuals of fewer than five microns in, in size and clusters to the droplets falling to the ground in a few feet. Droplet nuclei remain suspended in the air for long periods of time and are blown over great different distances, thus requiring engineering controls of negative pressure to be implemented in healthcare setting to reduce the likelihood of transmission. Some common examples of organisms that require airborne isolation is pulmonary tuberculosis, chicken pox that have been disseminated, um, smallpox, viral hemorrhagic fever, and COVID-19. 
For an individual on airborne precautions, the following PPE and steps are recommended. The patient should be placed in a private negative pressure room with all doors remaining closed to maintain negative pressure. Post an airborne sign outside the patient's room and communicate to all staff that the patient's care is needed for airborne precaution. Place a note and order set for airborne precaution in the patient's chart. All medical personnel entering the room should at least wear an N95 mask or PAPR and perform hand hygiene when entering and exiting. They can also wear gowns and other PPE as necessary. Each facility might have a different policy or procedure regarding visitors for individuals that are placed on airborne precautions. Refer to your own facility's policy or procedure, or procedure for clarification and guidance. If visitors are allowed in the room, the patient should be asked to wear a surgical mask during the visitation and the the visitor and the patient should all be in surgical masks and the patient should be educated on their precautions. If the facility does not have a negative pressure room available or if your facility is at capacity, you can create a negative pressure room by placing a high efficient particulate air filter or HEPA filter in a patient's room with doors closed to create this negative pressure environment. Traffic for these rooms should be reduced and staff should avoid going in and out of the room. Next, we'll talk about vehicle transmission that can occur in, with indirect transmission of infectious agent from food, water, biological products, and fomites. A vehicle may passively carry a pathogen, and a common example is hepatitis A. Another type of transmission by vectors are mosquitoes, fleas, ticks that carry infectious agents and can pass it on. This mode of transmission is usually seen in the community compared to healthcare settings. Many of these diseases, such as Lyme, Zika, Chagas, and others, will need to be reported to your local health department, but might not be required to be placed on isolation due to the risk of transmission being extremely low in a healthcare setting to patients and staff. In the next chain, we'll discuss the portal of entry. The portal of entry refers to how a pathogen enters a susceptible host. The portal of entry must provide access to a tissue where the pathogen can multiply or a toxin can act. Often, infectious agents use the same portal of entry to a new host as they use to exit the source host. An example will be an Im influenza virus exiting the respiratory tract of a source host and entering the respiratory tract of a new susceptible host. Another example includes GI-related diseases that go through the fecal oral route as a portal of entry. The infectious agent exits the source via feces, which is carried on inadequate washed hands as a vehicle or food, water, utensils, and enter a new house through the mouth. Other portals of entry include skin, mucotals, membranes, and blood. Lastly, we'll dis discuss what a susceptible host is. A susceptible host can be a person, environment, or inanimate object. A host susceptibility can be influenced by an individual's age, with older and younger individuals being more immune compromised. If an individual is susceptible to be infected, they, have, they might have experienced surgery, have an underlying disease, have an invasive device, such as a central line or a urinary catheter, is on steroids, has poor skin, uh, skin integrity or has skin breakdown such as a pressure ulcer and can be also influenced by chemotherapy, radiation, or poor nutrition. The next section that we are gonna discuss today is infectious agents that are required to be reported to public health officials and agencies. Infection prevention is the partnership with local, state, and federal health departments and healthcare facilities, it's a collaborative effort to ensure patients and staff safety. Each state has a specific list of infectious agents that will be required to be reported to the health department. Each local health department may have specific documents that they would like the facility to include when reporting an infectious agent. If you're unsure about your infectious um, reporting method, please reach out to your local health department as they might have specific case report forms and documents that is uh, needed to be when included when you are reporting. Here's just a common list of, of documents 
to include when reporting an infectious disease. If you are faxing information to your local health department, you always want to include a cover sheet, the case report form, patient's demographics, history and physical examination, positive laboratory results, physician notes, procedures, and treatment. These documents will provide the local health department with a brief overview of the patient, and they might ask you to include or omit specific documents based on the situation and the infectious agent. The local health department may also have specific case report forms that they would like you to include when you're reporting your mandatory infectious agent. The local health department may also want copies of the specific imaging that was performed. They will also may ask if the patient has been on isolation and might ask you to conduct a contact trace between patients and staff and also a bed trace. Some electronic medical records or EMR have these traces built into their EMR system. If you're unsure if yours does, please reach out to your IT or your bioinformatics team. And then here's the current 2023 Texas notifiable conditions. It is color coded to help understand the priority level. Red is an immediate phone call, blue is within one working day, and black allows within one week to report. And the last section that we are going to discuss today is a brief overview of infection prevention and control program practices in healthcare settings. Infection prevention and control programs, or IPCs, have evolved significantly over the last 70 years. These programs are responsible for implementing and recognizing and using recommendations from professionals and nonprofit organizations such as FDA, OSHA, CDC, NIOSH, SHEA, NIOSH, and WHO, just to name a few. The goal of these programs are to protect the patient by reducing transmission of infectious agents, protect healthcare workers, visitors, and others that are in the healthcare environment. And the last goal is to accomplish the first two goals in a cost-effective manner. An infection prevention and control program will develop different components, such as an infection control plan that involves the following components. An ICP plan involves many different departments and it's important to develop a culture of infection prevention control safety throughout your facility by using a multidisciplinary approach. The core components of an infection and prevention control program are identification of infectious diseases, surveillance and epidemiology investigations, prevention and controlling transmission of infectious agents, employer occupational health, management and communication, education and resource, environmental care, cleaning, disinfection, and, and sterilization. And now we'll discuss each of these components in detail. When it comes to identification of infectious diseases, it's imperative to understand the train of transmission as we discussed previously. After understanding the chain of transmission and how it plays into the epidemiology tri triangle, we can work with our facility to appropriate, to initiate appropriate infection prevention practices by identifying infectious agents, conducting antimicrobial testing to determine drug susceptibility and therefore implementing correct antimicrobial therapy. Here's a list of just a few laboratory tests that are used in some facilities to determine drug susceptibility. Please note that these are only a few and your facility may use other testing. So please reach out to your laboratory department to understand what micro tests are available to your facility that you are conducting. Next, each facility should have a multidisciplinary antibiotic stewardship program based on the facility's antimicrobial gram. The antimicrobial stewardship program goal is to help assess commonly used medications within the facility. Each facility will have a unique program structured around the facility's antimicrobial gram, which is the organisms that are commonly seen within the facility and within their community that they serve. The next component of infection prevention and control is conducting robust surveillance and epidemiology uh, investigation. Here are some common epidemiology terms, and it is important to make sure that we're using them correctly so we're communicating effective information to our team and throughout our facility. The main point of conducting surveillance in an epidemiology investigation is to determine if there is an association present and if there is a risk present as well, and if so, how severe is this risk? There are three different types of categories of association, 
and each one carries a different impact. There's an artificial association, an indirect association, and a causal association. And it's important to determine what type of association so that you can implement the correct infection control practices and procedures to address it. While conducting surveillance measures, the following statistics are used to communicate the severity of the issue to the facility. You wanna make sure that you're calculating infection rates, looking at summary statistics, incidence rates, prevalence rates, mortality rates, and others, just to name a few. A large component of infection prevention and control programs is tracking, trending, and reporting healthcare-associated infections to the CDC's National Health Safety Network, or what is known as NHSN. NHSN requires facilities to report all reportable hospital-acquired infections, or HAIs. It also provides definitions of what each HAI is, benchmarks for HAIs at the facility level, and provides guidelines and recommendations to prevent HAIs. The main healthcare-associated infections are followed. A central line-associated bloodstream infection, CLAPSI, a catheter-associated urinary tract infection, CAUTI, a hospital-onset C. diff, CDI, surgical site infections, SSIs, specifically looking at colorectal surgery procedures and hysterectomy surgical procedures, MDROs, <laughs> ventilator-associated events, and pneumonia related to ventilation and non-ventilation. Data surveillance and infection prevention and control programs involves reporting notifiable diseases, as we talked about, healthcare-associated infections, potentially identifying biological agents that could be used, emerging infectious diseases, cluster events, and outbreak events. Based on this information, the individual department will conduct a risk assessment. This assigns a numerical uh, severe score to each potential risk and helps prioritize surveillance effort to aim to address this issue and develop an infection prevention and control program to identify and prevent any potential gaps or concerning organisms or events. The statistics from surveillance data are used to communicate the severity of the issue within the infection prevention department and throughout the facility. Having these statistics readily available to create and direct performance improvement programs, initiatives, increase patient safety efforts and public health efforts. The next component of developing aspects of prevention is developing a department that is proactive, focuses on prevention and reactive, focuses on control. An IP department will develop the following items to achieve this goal. They will write an infection prevention control plan, policies specifically to the infection prevention department, general policies that we'll use throughout the facility. When writing these policies and developing their plan, they will use guidelines from APIC, other healthcare infection control advisory committees, CMS, Joint Commission, OSHA, WHO, NIOSH, and others. Infection prevention partners or helps oversees other components of employee health and occupational health programs. In some facilities, this department is under one tier, both infection prevention and occupational health, and sometimes there are two separate departments. Collaboration with the separate occupational health department to develop an environment that is safe to patients and employees is a priority. You will collaborate in developing policies and practices, reviewing environmental of care, work on exposure plans together, and provide facility-wide education. Sometimes, these two specialties will work together and sometimes they will run independent. Reach out to your healthcare facility to understand if these are within one department or if they're two separate departments. Some of the main focuses of employee health and occupational health programs are having an OSHA bloodborne pathogen ex exposure management plan, which they will use to develop an exposure plan, provide education based on the exposure plan, give medication administration prolactically, therapeutically and empirically, and post-exposure interventions and follow-up. They'll also produce employee education using PPE and looking at a 95 fit testing. They'll also go through donning and doffing as we did today as well. 
For more detail, please look at your facilities, employee and occupational health department for their policies. Management communication is a key component of infection prevention and control. An infection prevention control program should be developed based on the facility's needs. To develop a program, one should meet with key stakeholders to identify concern and gain buy-in. The, the department should communicate specific equipment, personnel, and other resources needed within the facility, perform cost benefit assessments, efficiency studies, and product evaluations, and provide recommendations and change in practices based on best clinical outcomes and financial implications. An infection prevention control program, along with other departments, is responsible for environmental care. The main components of environmental care are air quality, water standards, construction and renovations, environmental hazards, and environmental cleaning. These will be discussed in detail in later module presentations. A very pivotal component of infection prevention is education and research. The program will look, are being looked at as experts on standards and many departments will ask for your assistance to implement many infection prevention protocols and procedures throughout the facility. The, the department is responsible for facility-wide education, which is usually conducted at employee orientation, unit meetings, council meetings, and other types of meetings. The department will and can focus on research, especially when a new emerging disease is on the rise, such as we saw during COVID-19. Depending on your facility, the department may be asked to participate and oversee some research studies, review new research articles, and make recommendations in collaboration with other departments based on these research protocols. The last component we will discuss of infection prevention programs is cleaning, disinfections, and sterilization. Healthcare facilities use the Spalding classification to determine how clean, how to clean, disinfect, and sterilize devices. The Spalding classification involves three main components, such as non-critical items, semi-critical, and critical. Non-critical items require cleaning and disinfection. Semi-critical items create require high-level disinfection, and critical items, <coughs> excuse me require sterilization. Monitoring these, these components are critical. Monitoring programs must be conducted to ensure proper cleaning, disinfection, and sterilization practices are present. Many times, sterilization systems have built-in quality assurance measures, such as mechanical indicators, such as recording charts of load times and temperatures, along with monitoring the pressure gauges within the cycle load. Sterilization systems can be both chemical and biological indicators. These indicators should be monitored and results recorded to ensure quality insurance or in case of a recall or an exposure event occurs. The Infection Prevention and Control Department should conduct audits of these items that undergo sterilization or high-level disinfection. This will help identify any specific issues or gaps in practices, help ensure quality assurance, and prevent uh, future outbreaks. These will be discussed in detail in later presentations as well. Lastly, infection prevention and control is a very comprehensive and collaborative effort that understands the epidemiology triangle, chain of transmission, PPE implementations, develops a hand hygiene program, identifying infectious diseases, conducts surveillance, partners with employee health, performs environmental of care, and looks at cleaning, disinfection, and sterilization pro processes. It takes a multidisciplinary multidisciplinary team within the facility to achieve these goals. IP partners with many different departments, such as medical, nursing, respiratory, imaging, laboratory, and others, to name a, f a few, to develop a culture of IP throughout the facility. Collaboration between healthcare officials and the local public health department is key. IP and the local health department are in constant, con in constant communication on changing regulations and, and identifying infectious agents. This sometimes can be very hectic, but we need to remember that these emerging diseases is a very fluid situation and that regulations can change immediately. They are our team members and our partners. The most important goal of IP is to ensure a safety of patients and staff members throughout the facility. We just have one quick announcement before we move on to the question and answer section. Our next module titled preparedness 
will include the following topics, risk assessments, resources, waste management practices. Um, our next presentation will be sometime in May um, and a location will be determined. Be sure that you are registered with the right email address so that we can send, up, uh, send out updates once a date, time, and location are confirmed. So now we would like it to open up the floor for questions and hang back and answer any questions. Thank you. Do we have templates in TEFI uh, for these different plans that we can provide people as resources? A specific infection control plan template? No, so that's a, an infection pr prevention plan is specifically created by your service line, your patients you serve, and the bed. So like depending on if you are a, a 100 bed hospital versus a 1000 bed hospital versus a trauma one versus a dialysis center, you will have a specific plan tailored to your group that you serve. And then also with your staff, staffing ratio, and then the types of bed, like if you have a surgical intensive care unit, that plan will look very different than a medical intensive care unit. Uh, some of the resources that we have at the end are templates that you can use for hand hygiene monitoring, um, the Texas state reportable list, um, and other resources of templates that WHO and CDC have made available for use and are in the resource links in the slideshow presentation. How often can you check the spores test to see that the sterilizer is functioning to maximum capacity? So when you're looking at your biological indicators, when you're running the sterilization load, that should be done every single day. So on your first step of the day in sterile processing, you should be running your biological or chemical indicators to ensure that your process is already set. If you run that first load in the day and it fails, you should stop, rerun that load, and see if there was something with maybe the door shutting, the gauges, or the pressure off. If the second time it fails, it is recommended that you have a, con a conversation with your leadership team about possibly putting down that sterilizer for the day because it's not processing or approved of quality assurance so that you wanna make sure that it is cleaning appropriately. Um, at that time, if the second load fails, um, some recommendations is calling your manufacturer, getting them on the phone of saying, you know, hey, we're troubleshooting, this has failed, that has failed, we did this, um, and kind of get guidance, pull out your IFUs, your instructions for use manuals, see if they can help you with troubleshooting. But all of this before that happens, you should be talking to your leadership team about specific shutting down that service line so that they can um, communicate to the staff throughout the facility that there might be delays in surgery, bed turnover, or other types of procedures.
Once the recording is done, we'll send you an email with uh, um, a link to the recording that will also be posted on the Tefi YouTube sheet, uh, YouTube page, along with the slide deck as well. The last three slides of the slide deck are different resources that you guys can utilize in your facility. There's links of different forms that are presented today and other materials that might be useful to you. And please let us know if you have any questions. You can reach out to us. As the small rural healthcare port of Tefi, send us an email. We're happy to help um, with anything and get you connected. Thank you.